Hello and welcome to this 10th and last Future Seminar of the year. Today is UNESCO's World Futures Day and uh, we celebrate the day with the, this seminar where we will talk to Jonas and we will have a panel discussion and some questions. My name is Toki, I'm a head of communication here at the Institute. And uh, to those of you who don't know us, I would just like to mention that the Institute is an independent, uh, non-profit futures think tank. So today we will discuss, discuss um, how democracy can be developed uh, and how we can address the challenges we currently face. And we will try to envision how we can build better futures. So today you can expect to learn about why democratizing futures is not easy and not always fun, but it's, uh, it can be transformative and that's why we try to, to do it. You can try to uh, learn about the next frontier in organizational futures thinking. And you'll also learn how we can uh, find the voice of the youth and how to turn it into policy. So first, let's uh, have a discussion with uh, Jonas Mikkelsen. You are director here at the Institute. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. So to start off, can you uh, explain what you mean when we uh, discuss and when we talk about democratizing the future? Yes, yeah, so democratizing the future is of course multifaceted, but generally it's about a shift from going from what we can call, I would say, a white Western technology, predominantly technology-driven future to a more inclusive uh, approach. What we mean by that is that the future has maybe been a lot by the few, for the few, and the future belongs to everyone, so it needs to be by the many, for the many. And with that, we're looking at participation. So we need a lot more people to get involved and also empower that. And then also representation. We're missing representation of future generations especially, not just current generations that are, how can we say, removed in time and place from where the decisions are made, but also those who are now children and those who are unborn because they especially have a stake in the future. So that's sort of the core when we talk about democratizing the future. All right, can you speak a little more about what uh, communities and what people are not represented in the way we've been doing things uh, so far? Well, we have, of course, the Global South is, is, is one of the things, but, but what we're looking at, especially youth, uh, very much who has a very key stake in this, um, but also, and that is a key focus in the very vast development of the future, is especially the unborn generations. We are colonizing the future, as my colleague Lasse often says, and we really need to address that. So we have this issue about uh, voices and minorities and people who, who are not getting their voices heard. Yes. So what can we do about it? So there's two sides to address, essentially, um, to work with this proactively. And one side is the general public, and the other side is the decision makers, and policy makers. Um, on the general public side, one of the things that we are working on is what you call making society's futures literate. This is something also launched by UNESCO, where we share a chair together with Austin University in creating futures literacy. Essentially, that means that we're trying to give the people the tools um, to not only explore potential futures, but also understand what they explore and then also act upon it. And we're trying to do this so we can increase agency and empowerment. We can increase engagement, get more people involved because they now understand what they're actually getting involved with. And we can also foster positive activism. Um, one of the things that we can decrease, and of course there are multiple, but one of the things we especially focus on right now is this rise of futures anxiety. Uh, recent studies show that at least in six countries that participated that up to 75% of young people actually have futures anxiety. This is a major issue for us. So that's on one side. That's what we want to do in the general public. But we also have to address the decision makers. And that means for this, of course, we're talking a lot about what we call anticipatory leadership. But with this, we're more addressing government. So that would be anticipatory governance, something that we're trying to create. There's also a lot of focus on this from the UN. What that encompasses is one, a change in mindset. We are struggling a lot these days with short-termism. Um, if you look historically, we were actually very focused on posterity and legacy, albeit for various reasons, sometimes ego, but 
that kind of thinking in a positive way needs to come back because we need to think more long term. So we need to foster long termism. Um, secondly, just as with society, we need to implement futures capabilities. These are tools such as strategic foresight that we need to get into governance. And then lastly, of course, you also need to build the processes around it. So you have the organizational structure to actively work with this or by be that maybe a ministry for the future or whatever that might be. And of course, in this whole process, include this participation and also the representation as we talked about. All right. So we have all these issues and now we have some ideas about what we can do about it. Yes. So here at the Institute, what is, can you uh, explain what the initiatives that we are taking, what are we trying to do? Yeah. So again, two sided on one side in terms of equipping the general public public with these abilities, we of course uh, think it's important to start out with youth. So that's why we are focusing on education, especially. Um, we are part of a global movement that is spans across about 20 countries right now called Teach the Future, where we're trying to set up the uh, Danish hub also with a lot of different organizations, including Saga, which you'll hear from later on. Um, it's basically surrounding getting futures on the school curriculum. So we need to educate uh, in the future. Um, and this is, of course, something, by the way, both of those listening online and everybody here, uh, more than welcome. It's a nonprofit initiative. Uh, everybody who wants to get involved, uh, whether that be in foundations, schools, etc., come join us, uh, and you can definitely check it out on the website. Um, on and the other side, yes, uh, on, on government, uh, we're currently trying. One thing is we're widely involved on a global scale, together with a lot of our friends uh, around the world, and especially, of course, the UN. Secretary uh, General Guterres has been very uh, prominent in this field. Uh, there's going to be launched the Summit for the Future in 2024. Uh, which we are now also engaging with. We're also part of the Global Futures Forum um, and different initiatives. One thing we're not seeing is that, um, speaking on home turf, uh, our own country um, is not quite on the agenda yet, and we're hoping to to start uh, dialogue and debates, especially maybe within the, the upcoming government, about doing futures initiatives here at home and then starting a project to look at how could anticipatory governance look in a Danish context. How could we implement it here at home? So can you give one example on how you could imagine or envision an initiative looking? Well, if we look to some of our neighbors, um, also like for example, Finland, and we also see in, in the Netherlands, et cetera, in Germany, we're seeing some are actually structuring a like advisory department under a ministry. Some are operating, launching, well, basically building something like we already have here in the Institute that you basically just fatten up with a lot more competencies and, and advising across the, the whole of governance uh, and the public sector. Um, or you directly, which, of course, there's also a lot of debate on this is at a philosophical level right now, but should governments actually have a futures ministry where we actually have representation also from future generations that are not here yet? Very interesting. Yeah. And thank you for participating here. Thank so you. everybody uh, in here and back at home, feel free to reach out to Jonas yes. if you want to be included in any of the initiatives. And now we will uh, switch over and take a panel debate. So Nicolas and uh, Naima. Naima, please join us up yeah. here. And from uh, directly from Finland, we have uh, Sana with us online. Let's see if we can get her on the screen as well. And there we are. Hi, Sana. Hi. Hi. Okay. And the sound is good? Yes, yes. I hear you perfectly. Great. Thank you so much to all three of you for participating. And uh, I think we should uh, get right into it. So basically what I'm hoping to do is for you three to present yourself, uh, the organization that you represent, and start out uh, by explaining how you work to democratize the future. And Sana, let's start with you. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Sanna Rekola and I work as a foresight specialist in Citra and uh, Citra is a future fund uh, published by Finnish parliament in 67 and uh, our mission is to build a suc successful Finland for tomorrow and uh, uh, we our mission nowadays is to uh, build fair sustainable and inspiring future where uh, that ensures people's well-being uh, within the limits of uh, Earth's carrying capacity. 
And uh, in Foresight team, uh, we uh, our goal is that uh, futures thinking in Finland is more and more common and diverse groups of people feel empowered and uh, use power over future. And this is what we are working for. Uh, we think that future is something that we create together. And uh, this is our uh, connection point to, to today's theme. All right. Thank you so much. And just to let you know, we had a brief uh, sound uh, fallout here in the studio. I think everybody back home heard it. So if uh, I ask you something you just said, just uh, forgive me for that. <laughs> but thank you so much. Uh, let's uh, move on to you, Naima. Can you uh, uh, tell us who you are and how Saga is uh, working on this? Yeah. My name is uh, Naima Yassin, and I'm part of Saga, which is a party-neutral youth organization. We started um, June 2021. Uh, and the reason we exist is because we have a gap in, uh, in youth and the particip participation in democracy. I think it's uh, below 1% of young people uh, below the age of 30 that is part of a democratic party. But if you look at the, um, the numbers, 76% of all young people wants to actually engage in democracy, but they don't have the, they don't trust that they have the abilities to be part of the public debate. Uh, so that's the bridge we want to gap. I don't know if you know, Sana, but in Denmark, we have over 10 political parties, uh, but we have a lot of people who feel political homeless. They don't know where to exist. So we are trying to bridge that. Uh, we have 1,500 members, and uh, when they join, it's free to be part of it. And we ask them what, uh, what, what, what matters in their life, what are they fighting for? Uh, and they can answer, I fight for the right to be sad. I also fight uh, for climate justice, and then we just um, um, mark them in different courses. And f the first year, the three courses we are fighting for together, uh, whether you are blue or, or red, or whether you're social or liberal, it is the mental health, education, and the climate. And looking back on the last three or four years, we all understand why those courses are the ones that are most urgent. All right, thank you so much. And uh, Nicholas, can you uh, do the same? Uh, tell us <laughs> who you are and uh, the organization you work for. How do you work with democratizing the future? Yes, uh, so my name is Nicolas Arroyo. I'm, I was part of uh, starting a company called Bespoke like eight, nine years ago, where we've been working in the intersection between futures and design. So how do we use design tools, design methods to also bring futures thinking into you know, different contexts and different uh, uh, arenas? Uh, recently, we joined a company called ManyOne, so we are part now of a bigger uh, design family, we could say. Uh, and our work is very focused on, on the design aspect of, of futures and the design aspect of futures thinking, in, for, for that matter. Um, so we work with usually with very large organizations, uh, private and public, uh, aiming at uh, intervene, design, and yeah, carry on processes that uh, that have a future kind of outlook in them, but by involving people that usually would not take part of those processes. Um, you know, normal employees of a company that usually don't have a saying on what is the future that they see or what is the, um, what is the, the things that they are observing in the world and the questions, problematics, uh, fears and anxieties that they have that we can bring into, into these kinds of projects. Um, so we really believe in the impact of trying to inspire people, the people that is shaping the products, the services, and the experiences that we you know, consume and live by. Uh, we believe that by impacting them and by giving them tools to, you know, um, to bring this long-term thinking into their work, we can, uh, we can have an impact in you know, hopefully creating better businesses for, for people and the planet as well. All right. And so you three come from three different perspectives, but you're trying to do the same. So Naima, I would like to ask you, so what are the biggest barriers you are facing? What is the challenges you see when we're trying to uh, reach new people and find new voices? I think it's that somehow we have to move on from thinking that we have to listen. We have to listen to the global south. We have to listen to the young people. We have to listen to the ones that haven't been part of shaping the future. We have to do more than that. We have to empower. We have to give the tools to actually 
act upon and dissect and empower themselves. And that means that some people have to actually give up the mic. Some people have to give up their space in this structural society. And because we are all, at least in, in this um, uh, in the West, we have this idea that everything is uh, on your individual level, and we are never going to make a difference if we don't remove that um, societal pressure on the individuals and actually ask policymakers and societies and governments and EU and all those big um, institutions to actually use that power they have and, and uh, lead the way. There is a lot of uh, organizations and movements uh, from bottom up, uh, but they don't have the power to actually do the change. Uh, and it means that we have to give up the space sometimes. And some of, some of those biggest challenges are to acknowledge that somehow that change comes from disrupting it. <laughs> And I'm not trying to be like a violent, we need a revolution, but we do need a revolution. <laughs> and, and I'm not sure if the revolution will come in peace. Um, I can't remember a revolution that ever came in peace. I can't remember anyone giving um, up the rights for everyone else. Uh, women didn't get a right to vote just because men stood aside. Um, so, nope, I think we actually have to acknowledge that some of the movements we, we do comes with a sacrifice, and that sacrifice has to be on the 1% and not on the 99% that have been left behind. All right, interesting perspective. And that's a good segue to you, Sana, because you represent the uh, Sidra in Finland, where it is much more ingrained in the Finnish society, and it's become somewhat system systemic. So can you uh, tell us how did you get to the point you are now and where, how did you start? Have there been any violent revolutions or <laughs> where are we in that space? Well, I must say that we are not ready yet and we are very much in the process. But yeah, there are some uh, very good signs that people are really um, getting engaged to futures thinking and they, they uh, are very interested in uh, in thinking about futures and also um, empowered to influence the futures and i think in citra we have maybe contributed the uh, the development but of course uh, there are many other actors as well and and we also work closely together with other stakeholders uh, it is actually citra's approach to um, uh, <laughs> create uh, partnerships and, and do cooperation with others. So we, we think that alone we can't do anything. Uh, but if I, th if I think about um, futures thinking, I, I think um, that uh, now, especially during the last years, uh, the, the crisis we have uh, faced have uh, somehow uh, uh, made people to wake up and, and realize that uh, we are not on a path that we want to uh, continue and, and we must uh, start thinking about futures. And I think, um, and here in Citra, we, we witness a growing uh, interest of different kind of organizations, private companies, public sector, and also civil society organizations that they, um, they want to think uh, the future in a more long-term way and not just react uh, to to current crisis and, and politics but they they want to uh, be able to to uh, uh, yeah make it more more long term and and also uh, challenge the the short termism that uh, Jonas was also uh, talking about and um, I think um, yeah, there is a growing um, interest and, and quite many organizations throughout the society that are now uh, quite well uh, actually uh, thinking about futures and also uh, willing to, to discuss and organize events around this. And, and, and we are also in Citra trying to uh, uh, support uh, uh, the others to, to do this. Uh, and for example, next January, when we are uh, 
publishing our new megatrend report, uh, it's not up, uh, only about publishing the report, but we also want to uh, uh, enhance uh, discussion about futures. And we have uh, uh, launched this kind of a uh, side event concept, and we are inviting everyone to, to uh, organize their own side event uh, where they can then discuss about the megatrends and, and uh, think how, how they are linked to the developments and what they want to do and see in the future. All right, so that's about bringing the grassroots level and the top level together, uh, as far as yeah. I can tell. And you mentioned uh, also organizations, so that leads me to you. Can you, uh, can you see there's been a difference or a growing interest in working with the future and, and listening to more voices when you uh, work with organizations? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think um, when we started, the, the, I mean, traditionally there's been a lot of this need of having somebody to come and tell and show us the way. And um, I think we've been experiencing, you know, kind of a shift as well into more people becoming curious about the field and about knowing uh, what futures thinking is and how can we use it and what is the what's the actionable aspect of it be like besides just reflecting and thinking kind of how do we turn that into action like you were saying into actually concrete empowerment for people to change something so that's there's a shift there that that we have that we've seen uh, and also in our practice as well and that we have turned um from futurists into facilitators of spaces where these conversations can happen, where um, these discussions can occur, so we can <clears throat> together create a space. It's not too much about what we have to say. It's more about creating a space where those things can emerge. Because, you know, especially in, in organizations where very competent people, you know, we all read and we're all exposed to things all the time. So, so we all consume a lot of things that, we can, that makes us think, that makes us reflect. So it's about hosting those spaces where these conversations can can happen and equipping people with super simple tools and mindsets and methods to to do that and to bring that into their work. You mentioned that you also uh, try to inspire people to do to act on uh, on what they learn from you. Can you give us some examples of some of the concrete actions that the the organizations have done? Yeah, I think you see it a lot in especially with tech companies, I would say. I think we, we've been having, you know, the last 15, 20 years with the rise of, of technology and big tech companies that create amazing things that make possible all of this fantastic stuff, but also that created a lot of issues and a lot of problems in our societies. Um, so there we could see how sometimes uh, technology comes before the reflection of the impact that that technology could have in society in the planet in the future so we can see that you know they didn't really think about the unexpected unintended consequences of what they were designing right um, so we see a shift now as well with some of our clients especially technology clients that they they really want to try to understand hey we have solved this technological problem or you know this this uh, question that we had but what what are the questions that we don't know yet that we haven't really reflect on that might be Un unintended consequences in 10 or 20 years, right? Mm. Which is kind of what we didn't do before. Uh, so it becomes very applicable, especially for people that maybe, you know, is, uh, they're not thinking big or they're not thinking in, in the big picture, but they're, you know, trying to solve specific problems, engineers or coders or people that is trying to build the things that we, that move our society, right? So we need to bring these ideas and these thoughts to also to them because how they are designing uh, the products, the services, and the experiences that we use mm. is shaping how we live. You know, we like it or not. You know, like it is shaping the world. So, so they also need to know, hey, what are the, what is the responsibility that we have to develop things that you know, can make society better and 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 you know, people healthier, hopefully, and the, the planet better, right? So, and, you know, nine out of <laughs> ten or ninety nine percent, I would say, of of people that we meet, they want to have a positive impact mm. you know sometimes we tend to think that organizations are this like a uh, you know um anonymous corporations that you know don't have a face but actually inside this just very normal people like us and your cousin and your friend and <laughs> your uncle and they most of them at least that's my experience most of them want to have a positive impact and they want to feel proud of the work that they do 
mm. uh, and know that they contribute to something else. So I think it's, it's about empowering to, to, to think and believe that they can have that impact with the work that they do, no matter if they do tech or if they do, I don't know, a phone or whatever it is. Mm. Mm. So I, I would like all three of you to envision this utopian future where every, everything you're working for has already been completed. Now we have this perfect democratic society where all voices can be heard equally. So just go uh, uh, play along with the game here. I know that it's not uh, not going to be tomorrow or, or the day after. But what I'm trying to get at, what would a, a, a society look like if you got it the way you want to have it? So what are the positive changes that we would see in Naima? I think it's a it's a really good question because we rarely go there, right? We always, mm. at least in my field, we always stay where we crit we criticize the system, mm. and it's 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 fun to say um, to change it around and say if we want to live in a society where there is, for example, no prisons, how would it look like? Uh, if we want a society where uh, all youth had their own voice, what would it look like? And in 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 my worldview it would be a society where people actually trusted the way young people um, communicate and they already have the answers we live right now in society where young people are always question and mm -hmm. never trusted just because of their age which is a very um <laughs> horrible state of mind right because nobody will ever trust what you're saying is the truth just because you haven't li lived mm. long enough but we also have mm. a group of, of a generation of people who are the only one who've lived through a pandemic being 16 or 17 which is not something you will find in history books right mm. you will find other generation who lived in mm. in a europe that wasn't stable in a europe there was full wars in a europe that where climate change was also happening but not in the same state of mind as now so when, when we make these publications or these radio interviews or anything where you have a, an older person, I'll just say quotation mark, um, a PhD, um, someone who has the backing of, of, of some research to actually find the answers, instead of just asking the 17, 19 year old, because they already have the answers. They want communities. They are lacking the places where you can go and not be perfect and you're looking for places where you can make mistakes and not be judged. You're looking for uh, societies where you meet different generations and not meeting them in a place where you'll always be met with disbelief and dishonesty, but will m be mm. met with a place where you have the agency of your own life uh, and you have the agency to actually talk about what are the solutions you want and you have the power to actually sit next to the same person or the CEO at a table or in a board meeting, in a board room meeting, and be trusted mm. that you know how to um, find a budget to make this happen or anything. Mm. I think that is the utopian <laughs> society because right now, and I think the age um, age discrimination happens on both sides, right? I also meet a lot of old people who are uh, met with um, discrimination just because they're too old for the society. Mm. And, and, and those worldviews do not help any of us because then we create a society where everyone is afraid to get old because then you won't be part of the society. Mm. And we have a big group of young people who, who see democracy as this very close group and club where you are not allowed until you reach a certain age, which shouldn't be necessary, right? you should be able to join society as soon as you have something to contribute to. Mm. Um, so those are some of the con constraining things, um, creating this very closed democracy. And uh, Sana, so I'll, I'll give you the same question. So now we have heard Naima's take, and, and you're working with the, this issue from the top up. So let, let's imagine that I hop on the plane to uh, Helsinki, in this utopia, so how would the society look different than than it does today? Well, I really uh, liked uh, Naima's utopia, so I don't know if mine is so much different, but maybe I try to find some other angles. Um, my utopia would be uh, a world where uh, there would be no more marginalized groups, 
uh, but everyone would uh, feel part of society. So we would have a culture where uh, everyone has um, a place and a role and, and, uh, and everyone can feel that uh, their uh, opinions matter and, and they are heard in society. And I think this is very important when we think about the crisis we are facing now and uh, and even in the future, because I think we we, we are not able to uh, to to solve the climate change and, and other problems so easily. So I think uh, in my utopian world, we uh, would have stronger ability to uh, to imagine better futures and, and act upon these futures. So uh, the situation right now is uh, is is uh, is not so uh, uh, bright because uh, it's it's really um, uh, often this kind of short term thinking that we we uh, come up with when we try to find uh, solutions to to the problems and uh, we are quite often protecting our uh, own interests and privileges. And uh, this creates polarization and, and other uh, problems in the society. But if we would have this kind of a uh, space where everyone can uh, be part of visioning the better futures and, uh, and uh, uh, ask these questions that also Naima uh, said that uh, what if world was different? What if there was something uh, that was otherwise than now and, and everyone could uh, participate in, in these discussions? Uh, I think that would be a very good start for creating something new and, and something more beautiful. Uh, and in Citra, we really are working for these, these goals as well, uh, even though we are a uh, public organization and and uh, and in a way not the grassroots um, actor uh, we we try to reach the uh, the uh, uh, the the grassroots um, organizations by by making these partnerships and and also creating tools that uh, they can uh, use in their work uh, and and that way they they uh, hopefully uh, feel more empowered to influence in society. Uh, but yeah, this kind of culture where all people could participate and flourish and, and we would have uh, very strong muscles uh, to uh, practice futures thinking and, and uh, vision better futures together. All right, and Nicolas, so uh, I'll, I'll twist the question a bit because you uh, uh, work a lot with organizations and as you mentioned, organizations is basically just a, a bunch of people. But organizations is still organizations and often they need to be able to measure progress and they need to be able to look at what they're doing and saying, is this worth it? So can you tell us about how the organizations you work with or how are you at Bespoke um, encourage the organizations to make actual change and maybe even be able to measure the positive effects? Hmm. Is that something we can even do? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the big challenge, you know. Um, how does this translate into a, <laughs> a return of investment? That's the question that you always kind of hear around. Uh, what what do I get out of this uh, in, in that world? Because that's the language that is spoken in that world. Uh, but I think you also slowly see a change on uh, of KPIs, if you call it that way, on new new ways of measuring what is success. You know, it shouldn't be only about uh, profit and bottom line. Mm. There could be other other um, indicators to um, to show how successful a company can be. Uh, and of course, there are really good examples like like Patagonia, for example, who who measures success in a very different way. Uh, than the most uh, big clothing companies and, and they measure it in the, the way they can impact society for the better, right? And I think that that wave of thinking is slowly coming. I think we are very, very far away from from where it should be. But but I, I, I could see that there, that wave of, of thinking is coming, is changing. Um, employee satisfaction as well is something that is kind of talked a lot about, you know, about well-being. You know, do we want to be a company that wants to only make profit or do we want our employees to be happy and healthier and 
um, and proud of being there. So there's a, there's a lot of new new things that are very hard to measure as well because they are quite uh, abstract some, sometimes. But but there is there is a change on on how uh, how are we measuring the impact of some of these things. So and and. I'll, I'll turn that into a, a, a question for you again then. So let's uh, say there's a lot of people in the room here and a lot of people listening at home. So if they want to be part of this journey or uh, let's say initiative to democratize the future and start to lifting marginalized voices, what are, the, what are some of the first steps that you could, would recommend you take when you're listening to this conversation? What can they do? Hmm. I would say that uh, it is about creating spaces where people can... Uh, talk together. I think mm. it's plain simple. Sometimes it's not that sophisticated. Is uh, I like one of the definitions of uh, dialogue is uh, an exchange of meanings, and in and it's about also getting lost together, which I think is really beautiful. Mm. And sometimes we need spaces where we need to get lost together in an idea, and we don't need to necessarily be super direct into what is the outcome of this conversation. It can be a conversation for the sake of having a conversation that makes you reflect and that will have an impact on what kind of decisions you're, you're taking. So, you know, it's, for me, it's super simple. It's like creating instances and spaces where people within an organization or organizations with the customers or uh, the users or a public organization, whatever, where they can host conversations that matter that we, they can question themselves like, hey, what, what are we doing and how are we doing things? Does this make sense still in the 21st century with the climate crisis that we're facing, with the societal crises that we're facing? Does this make sense or do we need to change something? Right? Mm. Because I think that's, that only comes from that, from that reflection. Uh, and that can come bottom up uh, in most cases. It doesn't need to always come top down. That helps a lot to move things faster, but mm. um, there's a big power in... And when people realize that, and they can affect also their leadership to to take better decisions. Mm. And Naima, the same question for you. So, what are mm. the some of the first steps you can take if you're listening to this conversation? In your opinion, I think just a, just a note on, on on what you just said. I think for those dialogues and those spaces to happen, people actually have to feel safe to be able to express those views and mm. and sayings. And it, it, it needs to come from top down because you need a leader that is not afraid to actually sit still and just listen. And we've all had those corporate meetings where the boss will come in and they will say what they, what they actually mean. And then they'll be like, but what do you mean? Who is going to say something that will go against what someone who's paying your rent is saying? <laughs> you will not do that. Um, so I think we need, it, it starts with um, the vocabulary, the words that we use, and and we normally say, in, in Danish at least, that the future is in our hands. The future is actually in our mouth. It starts with the words that we're mm. using. We live, at least I live in a society where we think we are the developed, but everything I'm wearing and everything I live is not made in here. It's made mm. in the global south. So who's actually the developed societies <laughs> when we can't even uh, take care of ourselves and we are dependent on other nations and other societies and other continent to actually run the society. So it starts with the with the words we use, and it starts with saying, um, at least in 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 Saga, we talk about what does it mean because the numbers keep saying the young people uh, are not part of the democratic conversation. Uh, but how do you measure that? Is that by pe being part of global uh, a political party? Is that being in demonstrations? Uh, being part of the democratic society and conversation is also um, turning off your phone and taking a walk with your friend. Democratic uh, conversation is also uh, not buying meat uh, or making a boycott somewhere. Democratic society is also hosting an event, uh, doing something because all our lives have become political. There's no one in this room who does not live a political free life. Wherever you go to school, what kind of public transportation you take has been decided by politicians. So we also need to, in, in, we need to uh, uh, increase that space where the people with power are not just within the 10% of society. We need to allocate that power everywhere or we need to educate everyone in where do you actually get influence. Influence is not having um, a right to vote every fourth year, right? 
So in Denmark, 10% of the Danish population has no right to vote. But you can talk about um, when you live in, a, in, a, in an area where the government uh, have decided to, um, to break down your building because it, is, it doesn't regulate to some um, idea of who's integrated, right? You have a boardroom, you have people sitting in boards in those societies who decides what's going to happen to your building. That is a place of influence. You can sit in different boardrooms, you can have that influence different places in society that is not dependent on a right to vote. So we need to educate everyone in where do you go in society to have an influence in our society so you don't give up the right for everyone else to make that um, decisions for you. And it is it's a lot to take on as an individual, but it also means that you have to trust that you won't get thrown into jail or you won't get thrown out of the country just because you had another um, opinion um, of how to live and have the right mm. to be part of those conversations. And it's not a lot of people that are allowed to have those conversations as long as we do those, have those conversations on, I don't know, uh, technological platforms that was not based on democratic uh, um, ideas. <laughs> uh, if we talk about um, uh, freedom of speech, it's not the same freedom of speech we have in Europe because we know the consequences of that. Uh, if you compare that to the freedom of speech in the, in the US, which is much younger than us and who doesn't have the same experience of freedom of speech. So, so where do we have those conversations and who decides who have those conversations and who get a blue check mark and, and have the right to say something without consequences? All of those things matter. So the, it starts with our vocabulary and how do we have those conversations where everyone is empowered to be part of the conversation? Very interesting. So before we move on to questions, I just wanted to give you, Sana, the last word. And uh, perhaps you can, if you can give us one insight or one last nugget of wisdom to, uh, to, to, to go home with for this weekend to think about, what would you choose? Well, I would continue with, uh, what, from what Naima said, that um, democracy is happening everywhere. And uh, I think the future is made uh, by our um, by every action and every decision, and also uh, by the the actions and decisions we don't make. and And we should uh, uh, think that uh, think think about democracy more wider than uh, maybe we think nowadays. Uh, that it's mostly about voting or or uh, participating in political debates. But we should uh, see how how uh, the whole how it's about the culture and 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 also the uh, ways we uh, encourage people to take uh, the steps to participate and and express their opinions. Thank you so much. And uh, August, do you have? Uh uh, any questions coming in, and 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 you you guys in the audience can so, can also uh, raise your hand if you have uh, any good ideas. Yes, yeah, so we have a, a hand over here. Hi. Mm. Um, so my question is Victoria from EIT Urban Mobility, hosted here in uh, Blocks Hub. My question is: You've touched a little bit upon the role of big tech and also shaping our future, the language. And I know that in the U.S. there is also a big uh, conversation about it in Congress. And I was wondering, um, the question is for you, um, how, how is it handled in the organizations like the ministries that are focusing on the future or public or, uh, organizations in Europe that are dealing with that subject? How are we bringing big tech in the conversation or legislating or what, what is happening mm -hmm. in that space? I think this is a question for Sana, right? Yes. 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 Well, thank you. Uh, I don't know if I have a clear answer to you. Uh, it's a, such a difficult question, but I think, yes, definitely we need to bring big tech uh, to, to the conversations. And um, right now, uh, luckily, we are seeing some kind of regulation tsunami happening in European Union, at least, uh, that uh, 
also is bringing the big tech companies to the same table with uh, with others to discuss about the uh, rules and uh, and uh, how uh, also we should uh, uh, make sure that people have right to their uh, privacy and and so on uh, and their data in generally uh, so yes i think uh, the problem is that um, uh, we are quite dependent on on the big uh, tech companies right now and and also the public discussions uh, are, are, are um, uh, very much discussed in in their platforms uh, but that's uh, especially that is the reason why we, we need to uh, start uh, discussing about the regulations together and also uh, enable people to, to have a say in this development. Thank you. And August, do we have any questions yeah, from I online? So we have one from uh, Lillian Marino who asks whether it is the education system, a revolution in the education system, which is the most important way forward to integrate uh, democratizing the future in society. Naima, perhaps? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great way to, uh, a great place to start, but they can't do that without the budget and without the, the agency to actually change it. I think we need uh, education in, in, in finance. We have uh, young kids uh, at the age of eight who's actually uh, developing uh, a um, gambling addiction uh, because of the games they're playing. And we have uh, grown-ups and, 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 and parents who, who remember as a, a time where there were no cash. So the, the, um, the value of money, we need to re-educate ourselves in that because everything is digital. We need to educate and learn and unlearn and relearn the value of identity. Uh, where do you go when you don't feel whole and you always have an Instagram or something to look up to? Uh, and which is a lot of the reasons behind our mental health issues, right? We can find all the money to go into psychiatrists and the hospitals, but we never get to the root of why people are miserable. Uh, because there's no space to ask that. You you have 15 minutes at the doctors, and you had, if you have more than one problem, you have to find another uh, uh, appointment. And I'm not blaming this on the doctors, because it's, again, a societal uh, issue and a structural issue. But we can do a lot uh, from educational point of view, but they need the agency, and they need the budget, and they need the hands, and, and we actually need to restructure our system to to help where everything is needed. We live in a society where you get more money by sitting in front of a screen than actually educating a lot of kids or, or, or saving lives or risking lives or, and, and stuff like that. So there's a lot of in our society of status quo that we haven't never questioned why is it we live the way we live. Mm. And there's no one that is brave enough to change that because you can't measure the KPIs in, in a four-year term. <laughs> so we need more people to live in a... 50 year term and say, I might not see the change in my lifetime, but I'm willing to risk it to, to create those changes. And that is an educational system. Thank you. Do we have one last question, August? Uh, yeah, and actually follows quite well from what you just answered. So this one's from Alana Rosa in Germany. And they ask, well, they say, in Wales, there is a government appointed commissioner for the future. Do you think that integrating futures thinking in civil society is best achieved on a governmental level, or is it best achieved by NGOs, think tanks, and other relevant stakeholder organizations? So I think we should take Sana for this one. Thanks. Well, I think everyone, all the organizations should be um, involved uh, and we need a governmental uh, uh, action because they 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 can then also uh, direct the, uh, the 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 development in 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 other sectors of society. But uh, I think um, the governments don't do the changes by themselves and we need pressure created by civil society organizations and, and also other actors in society. And the changes on, on a governmental level can be uh, 
quite uh, slow sometimes. So in a way, uh, the make the development faster uh, to to get future generations views integrated. We need also uh, others and, and, and these points of view raised by, by all of us, uh, all kind of organizations, if I understood the question correctly. All right, thank you so much. So it's not a question about who has a responsibility. It's more about how everybody on all levels can participate. So thank you so much for the panel for being here. It's been a huge pleasure talking to all of you. And uh, to everybody listening at home, thank you for tuning in. Uh, this is the last future seminar we hold this year. We hope to, uh, to have uh, every one of you back next year again. Uh, until then, remember you can become a Futures member here at the, uh, the Institute. And uh, if you do that, you'll get a subscription to our uh, publication Farsight. You'll be uh, able to join a lot more of these conversations. And uh, you'll uh, obviously also support our initiatives, which is what, what we've been talking about today. So consider that. And uh, then all that's left to say is wish you all a happy holiday season and a happy World Futures Day. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you.